Hi, everybody. Welcome to this afternoon's Flyer Inside chat. We're going to be getting ready here in a few moments to get started. Please make sure that your audio devices are um, ready to receive our broadcast this afternoon. Everybody, if you just want to make sure that your audio is good to go, we're going to be starting our chat in about a minute with Dr. Garza. Welcome to Penn State Berks Lionside Chats. My name is Sonia Deliquato, and I am one of the three Lionside Chat moderators working along Don Pfeiffer Wright and my colleague, Dr. Ryan Hassler. Come on in and welcome to our campus. We're so glad that you could join us today. Uh, before we get started, we wanted to share that you should please feel free to submit questions throughout the program via the Q&A feature. We will not be utilizing the raise hand feature today. Once our presentation concludes, we're going to facilitate an engaging discussion with our presenter. Um, we're also going to be recording today's session, so you can always revisit um, the topic or even share this experience with your friends and family. So now we would like to welcome Dr. Garza. Sorry about that. I'm having a little technical difficulty here. <laughs> um, and Dr. Garza is a professor at Penn State Berks. He's the associate professor and chair of mathematics. And we would like to welcome him today. And he is going to be speaking with us about curve flattening. And Dr. Garza, are you ready to start your presentation? I am. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us for this brief and friendly presentation on the introduction to the mathematics of curve flattening. So I approach this talk with, uh, with evenness at hand, so I'm not interested in giving anybody a nosebleed. If you came here for a lot of math, I am going to disappoint you severely. Like I said in uh, my description, if you can multiply two numbers together, you should be able to follow what we're doing. Okay, so uh, we hear this exponential growth all over the place. Everything's exponential growth, this exponential growth, that. Uh, but what exactly does that mean? I mean, that, let's just go back to, to how we count. We like base 10 because, well, I mean, well, you know, we have 10 fingers. Now, if you were sandals like my uh, ancestors, you know, you could have used base 20 because, hey, you have twice the computing ability. Sumerians and Babylonians use base 60. Uh, you know, who knows? Maybe they, you know, they walked around the triplets. No, but actually, the curious thing is that uh, the number 60 is very good for counting because it has a lot of divisors. So it has a half, a third, a fifth, a sixth, you know, a twelfth, on and on and on. And you can count 
on base 12 with one hand. If you just take your thumb and you point at the joints in each finger, you can come from one to 12. So that's actually pretty, pretty clever. Uh, but beyond that, what does nature uh, use in general? So a little bit of history here. In 1720s, 1727, 1728, Leonhard Euler, who is recognized as one of the greatest mathematicians to walk on this planet thus far, uh, gave a name to this number. Uh, he called it E. There are, there's wide speculation as to why it's E. Does it stand for exponential? Does it stand for Euler? Whatever the case, it is an irrational number, meaning that it has an infinite decimal expansion. But he didn't come up with it, he just coined the term. Uh, the work on this number began much, much earlier with a Scottish mathematician, John Napier, who was trying to do some work using logarithms, basically trying to uh, come up with a methodology for more expediency in working with very large numbers. And then throughout the years, there were contributions by uh, Jacob Bernoulli, who was working on interest rates, and Gottfried Leibniz, who's also recognized as one of the creators of calculus. Well, this number is of relevance because uh, nature kind of likes it for propagation phenomena. So here is what the graph of the exponential function looks like. If we take this number e and multiply it by itself as many times as we want, we are going to obtain this graph. So e raised to the first power is just e times one. e raised to the second power is e times e. e raised to the third power is e times e times e. So since e is you know, between two and three closer to three, we can see how quickly it grows. e squared is close to nine, e cubed is close to 27. And you know, in short, if we multiply the number e by itself, you know, around 30 times or so, we, we are hitting 2,500. So this, this graph evolves very, very quickly. Now, let me switch gears a little bit. And let's talk a little bit about the basic population model. So if you're interested in breeding bunny rabbits, you would like to have, you know, a consistent source of bunny rabbits. So you want your bunny rabbits to be propagating so that you can, you know, have a profitable business. So the population rate of change, this DP over DT business, is equal to a number called the propagation rate, here denoted as R, and the population present at any given time. I mean, we think about it, it makes sense. For you to make bunny rabbits, you need to have bunny rabbits. Uh, if all you have is, you know, boy, bunny, rabbits, uh, this is not going to work. So you need to have a suitable population. And so, you know, bunny rabbits have a specific propagation rate and so on. But the rate of change of the population will depend on how many members of the population are together at any given time. So this rate of change business, uh, let's bring in a little bit of um, high school algebra. Uh, we can think of it as the slope of a line. Now, in terms of units, we have the change in population over the change in time. So if you remember the slope as in like rise over run, delta y over delta x, this is the exact same thing. Well, I mean, I have an arrow because there's a lot of like calculus involved, but basically, you know, talking about slopes, right? So the change in population over the change in time gives us a rate of change. Now, here I have uh, some data that I plotted. What we're looking at is the uh, daily cases in Pennsylvania between March 6th and April 9th. So when the uh, pandemic started, you know, I was tracking numbers very carefully. I was making my own spreadsheets and so on. And so what I have right here, right, all these entries, are giving me the change from one day to the next. So if we look at the bottom, where I have that 277 circled, that's on March 25th. That's actually the number of new cases from March 24th to March 25th. So March 24th, there were 851 cases. March 25th, there were 1128. So over a period of one day, that means that we have a rate of 227, 277 new cases per day. 
And so that's what every single one of these numbers mean. It is the change in the population from one day to the next, right? So that's slope business. So let's remember that this number represents the slope of a line. So what I have right here, I have a field where I, I have had the computer draw a bunch of these, um, bunch of line segments, each one with a slope related to a rate of change. Now for any one particular case, for example, our pandemic, we wouldn't have all these many slopes. Uh, here I have many slopes all together. This respond to different propagation rates and a couple more things. Interesting thing though, is that there is a curve that fits these little slopes and it is the exponential function. So this population model, this very simple population model, actually responds to an exponential growth. So the function p of t that I wrote there has this obscure thing p sub zero, that is just the initial population. Then I have my exponential function raised to power r, and in this particular case, r is a fixed number. And then t is my time. So as t increases, the population will increase corresponding to the appropriate uh, propagation rate. So if the value of r is bigger, then all these slopes are going to be a lot steeper and the graph is going to grow a lot faster. If the initial population is larger, then where the graph begins on the left is going to be shifting up. So here I have again uh, data from Pennsylvania. These are the total cases in Pennsylvania from March 6th through April 9th. And um, so we see that, you know, we go into the thousands and then I did a, a quick, you know, model with my computer. And there is an exponential curve that actually fits, you know, pretty okay, uh, this data set. Not exactly. I mean, it can't because of shallow variability in the cases, you know, for my computer, I assume that the propagation rate was constant and it, it is not. The, these problems are mathematically very, very complicated. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But then uh, it will let the clock tick. Past March 6th, my little model curve just keeps on going. But the actual cases in Pennsylvania uh, don't. So they start, you know, going in an opposite direction. So uh, I mean, what is up with that? What, what went wrong with this model? Well, again, it's a very simple model. Now, if my little model were true, if the propagation rate were constant, then all Pennsylvanians would have been infected in about 76 days, you know, 12.8 million Pennsylvanians in 76 days or so. Uh, but again, this, this propagation rate is not constant. And what is happening, of course, is that um, the number of infections cannot grow unbounded because, you know, you can only have so many people to infect at any one given time. So eventually, uh, it runs out of resources. So here we have another model, which is called the logistics model. Now, mathematically, it looks a little bit more convoluted. Uh, but it's, it's also rather simple. So let's remember that P is the number of individuals at any one time. R is my little propagation rate. And this expression P max is the maximum available population. So we're thinking in terms of Pennsylvania that P max is a fixed number of 4.8 million. So when the infection begins, uh, the ratio P over P max is very close to zero. You know, you could have one, two, three, eight, 12 cases divided by 12.8 million. So that's a very, very, very small number. So early on, this little model behaves just like the previous model I presented, because I have R times one minus mostly zero times P. So it's basically uh, R times P. However, as the cases progress, then P over P max, starts getting closer and closer and closer to one, to the point where 
the expression one minus P over P max will actually approach zero. And so here I have some simple curves. These are not related to any data. This is just a uh, just mathematical formulation. So I took two models um, with a population, I think of like 85,000. And I, I put in two different rates associated with it. And so what we notice is that the gold curve with a rate of like 0.7 uh, grows very sharply. Whereas the blue curve with a rate of you know 0.3 uh, doesn't grow as sharply, it's less steep. However, around day 50, both graphs coincide. So in terms of infections, what this would mean is that the same number of people are going to get infected. However, if your propagation rate is higher, the infection will occur sooner. So here, what I, what I plotted were the rate of change of the population, right? rate of change of infections versus time. And so we see that the gold curve rises very sharply. So this is the flattening of the curve issue that we hear about. If we are able to reduce this propagation rate, then the same number of people may get infected, but the infections are going to be spread over a larger time frame. If the value of the, propag uh, the propagation rate is high, then a lot of infections are going to occur very, very quickly, uh, one right next to the other. But again, let me remind you that this is still a very, very simple. Um, if you observed uh, Dr. Mahoney's presentation a few days ago, uh, he talked about a, a more applied model called the SIR model. I'll collect my $5 later, Joe. So if we are able to expose fewer uh, individuals to the virus at any given time, the rate of infection will decrease, right? So if you bring a lot of people together, then the virus has a good chance of jumping from person to person to person very quickly. That will bring the propagation rate up. And so this idea of flattening the curve means that if you can restrict the population that is exposed at any one time, your rate of exposure, your propagation rate will be smaller. So as many people may still get infected, but it's gonna happen over a longer period of time. So from a practical perspective, the idea here would be to keep the medical facilities from becoming overwhelmed. If everybody gets sick within a week, then the hospitals are going to be overrun. And I mean, we have already seen that. So here I have some information from uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, basically, you know, a, a more refined version of, of what I did initially with my Excel spreadsheet. So here we have the uh, new infections in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, you know, current up to uh, things like yesterday. And so here we note that the highest infection occurred on April 9th, and it was 1,733 new cases. But then after that, the number of new cases started dropping, you know, a little bit reluctantly, but they were dropping. And we can pretty much see when it is that the counties um, in, in Pennsylvania started reopening because there's an uptick again. So the pink bar on the right signifies that the propagation rate again is on the rise. So now more people are getting sick. It's still not too bad, but uh, more infections are about. So I'm going to show you a bunch of graphs right now that I extracted from the Johns Hopkins uh, website. It is an incredible resource. So if you're curious, if you're just clicking and you don't know why you're clicking buttons, you might as well go here and learn a few things. Here is just a very quick map of all the states with their graphs. Uh, so let's, let's cut a couple of them. Here's New York, right? I mean, we all saw horrified early on how New York, New York City especially 
got pummeled by this disease. Uh, I mean, the, the growth rate is very exponential, it's very scary, and they had their highest rate of new cases on April 9th, same as Pennsylvania, actually. But look at that, it's like 10,800 new cases on a single day. The number of cases in Pennsylvania currently, total cases, is less than 100,000. And in New York City, in a single day, back in April, they presented about you know a ninth of the total cases that would appear in Pennsylvania by July. That is super scary, but why is that? Because look at the concentration of people in New York City. If you bring a lot of people together very closely, well then the virus is gonna jump and jump it did. Now, we also saw that they took some very, very strict measures and uh, they turned the curve around. I mean, th this is what curve flattening is. So reduce the number of exposures, the number of new cases drops down, and again, you know, so the state reopened and we're seeing an uptick in new cases. That is not unexpected, but it is not severe. And then there's Florida. So I kept looking at the numbers in Florida from the beginning uh, because I did all my education in Florida. I spent 13 years there. So there was this innate curiosity to see, you know, how are things going on in, you know, my previous home state. And the situation over there is just, it's just terrifying, you know, whereas New York and Pennsylvania hit the highest number of new cases in April. In Florida, they're still going. I mean, every single day is a new case. So it almost looks like they uh, flattened the curve early on, you know, you can see around April, but that's not it. I mean, the infection is hitting them right now. And it's, it's very severe. Now here's a different side of the coin. This is Delaware. And so in Delaware, they, you know, the population is a lot smaller than in many other states. So immediately you have fewer exposures. I mean, there are a couple of large cities, but even then, uh, they're not like Philadelphia, New York City. Then, you know, they had their fair of, of cases. Their highest on their poll 27 was 333. But then, they turned the other curve around and it kind of jumped back up and it came back down. But the number of rates, uh, the propagation rate keeps going down and that's where there's a, a little green bar. So Delaware is on its way uh, to get rid of the infection if they can continue the trend. Here's Louisiana. Louisiana, uh, it's very interesting. They have a huge spike and then they turn the curve and they're back on the saddle. So it's a one two punch. So in April, you know, highest number of cases, and then there the cases drop dramatically, and then back up. And here we are in July, 2,217 new cases in a single day. And Texas, you know, we've heard a lot about Texas, and it's for this specific reason. There, you know, they haven't begun to, uh, well, they haven't got to the apex yet. They have yet to get to the tip before they can start talking about flattening the curve. So these are my references. Uh, I, I strongly recommend that you consider visiting. Of course, the CDC has a very good website, uh, Johns Hopkins. And it's a fascinating uh, resource. And of course, you know, I, I also go to the Pennsylvania Department of Health website. And with that, I uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Garza. Uh, that was wonderful information and I caught up with you mostly at the end. Uh, <laughs> um, now I'd like to introduce Dawn Pfeiffer Rice, who will help facilitate some Q&A. So to our audience, please submit your questions um, as we have our um, curve flattening expert with us today. I actually just have a quick question for you, Dr. Garza. Could you share with us what your personal hypothesis is on why Florida and why Texas experienced that? Why is there a delay there, like based off of the research that you did? Well, I mean, 
Uh, thank you for calling me an expert of flattening curves, but I, I am nothing <laughs> like that. Nothing, not even close. I mean, there are professionals who dedicate their lives to that. I'm just an observer that knows a little bit of math. Um, well, I, you know, there's a lot of information available, and this is just you know, my own personal impression. And that is that my understanding is that there are two strains of the virus circling around. And even though the first cases came in Washington state, that was the first strain of the virus that came out of, of Wuhan. And actually that became uh, overtaken by the second strain. So if my understanding is correct, the second strain is a lot more virulent and it completely overshadowed the first one. So that's why Washington state, you know, shown a little bit and then it kind of dissipated but then we have on the East Coast, New York City, uh, all the cases coming from Europe, and those were the second strain. So there's a lot of migration into uh, New York, and they got hammered, New Jersey got hammered, we got hammered, I mean, we were in very close vicinity. So the migration from New York City to Texas to Florida is more limited than what happened here. However, in Miami, they, they had uh, a lot of cases in the beginning. It's just that they um, didn't take it seriously. They didn't see the cases growing. And um, I mean, in in Texas, they're still talking about uh, how to manage their closures and so on. Mm -hmm. So they they were not as aggressive as they should have been. And here are the results. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I offer, uh, I remind our audience to feel free to submit questions in the Q&A pod at the bottom. Um, I do have a question that I think I know your answer to, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, what is your opinion of how, whether or not social distancing is working? I mean, plain and simple. It's not working. <laughs> it's not working. I'm kidding. Of course, of course it works. Uh, I mean, the from the outer, right, the, the very simple model. If you starve the virus, the virus doesn't propagate. And so there's a very different thing between saying, I am, you know, growing bunny rabbits because you need, you know, two bunny rabbits of different <laughs> sexes to make new bunny rabbits. A virus enters into a body and then it's, it infects the cells and then uses the cells to propagate and then you sneeze. And the moment that you sneeze, you have like millions of copies of the virus coming out. So you bring people in close proximity and these fluids are going to exchange and people will get infected. So this prevalence of masks and social distancing is a very, very important. Um, I think uh, Dr. Tribe said it best mm -hmm. when she gave her, her chat, right? That we use the mask not to protect ourselves, we use the mask to protect others so that we keep our own fluids you know, to ourselves. And if you're far away, this coronavirus apparently is fairly heavy, so it doesn't travel more than six feet, you know, from a regular sneeze. So, yeah, social distancing is working. I mean, you see the numbers in Pennsylvania, right? We, we did yeah. it, and here we are. And um, one of the questions that came in is, is asking essentially, um, well, it's commenting that uh, many of our younger members of the population seemingly are a little bit more cavalier with this perspective um, in terms of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, do you have any comments about that? I know that if, if you know, you take everything that you've talked about today, I think I can also speculate what your answer is, but um, you know, how can we impress upon our younger folks to follow along with the masks? Well, they're invincible, just like I was when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. Just like you were, right? And that was also very stupid. So these are, these are different times. And it, it, the message just has to be out there. It has to be continuous. Again, as a teenager, I remember not listening to my parents. They had to repeat things many, many, many times. I'd be like, yeah, whatever. Uh, so hopefully they'll listen to the message. I mean, in the news, we are already hearing of tragic circumstances of young people dying because they went to COVID parties. Uh, when I lived in Florida, there were also hurricane parties. You know, people hosting parties at the beach, having hurricane parties. Again, it's all fun and games until somebody gets hurt. The people are getting hurt. 
So I think it's it's time to you know put your you know big person shoes on and and say like you know this is not fun and games. No, and I that um, as a parent of a, a young adult and two teenagers, that's a conversation that we have continually in our house, and um, you know that's a, it's just a huge thing because I do remember being a teenager um, and and some of those choices and the lies. But we could talk about that in another live side chat. We have another question that has come in: Are death rate curves matching positive test result curves in many states? Are death rate curves matching positive test result curves? In many states, uh, that's a that's a Dr. Fauci question. But <laughs> I, I mean, I, 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 I would speculate. I'll, I'll be honest mm -hmm. with you. I, I haven't looked at the data. Sure. Uh, it it would make sense. Uh, I mean, we still don't know a lot about this this virus. It's a it's a very complicated thing, right? So all this data that Johns Hopkins is producing uh, actually comes from supercomputers. Mm. You know, they are using supercomputers to crunch all the numbers that they get from the nation. You know, I just looked at the numbers that they produced and, you know, did a quick analysis of my, my computer, which is, you know, just for a presentation. So it, it is very complicated and everything points at, at this virus being fairly dangerous. So I, yeah, you know, what you hear right now is that we are expecting for the death rates to start increasing dramatically in states like Florida and Texas. And I mean, and they are, right? In the news, they're already talking about bringing uh, freezer trucks to places, I think in Maricopa County and other places in Texas because the morgues are overrun. Yep. So yeah, I, I think there's a correlation. I cannot tell you more than that, but I, it makes sense to me. No, and I, and I appreciate that. And, and, you know, sometimes with our line side chats, we do get questions that we're just not able to answer. Um, and just for the record, we uh, will be making a request to see if we can get Dr. Fauci on a future chat. So stay tuned for that to all of our listeners. Um, another question, uh, can you explain about the relationship between an exponential and a logar logarithmic, I can't speak math, curve with regards to flattening the curve? You got that? Or should I, should I try to butcher that one more time? <laughs> the, yeah, the relationship between a, an exponential curve and a logarithmic curve. Logarithmic, there. <laughs> so there's there's a transition in the um, in the logarithmic uh, model. The curve starts the you know the total population curve begins exponential, but then it switches to a logarithmic row. So a logarithmic function is the uh, let me try not to get too mathematical here. <laughs> so it is the opposite of an exponential curve. An opposite doesn't cut it. Technical words an inverse. But basically, the input of one on <clears throat> is the output of the other. So if you want to cancel them out, you put one inside the other, and poof, they cancel out. So uh, in in terms of solving it, the logarithm is the exponential power of the exponential function but that's just that's just jip, 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 jip. i appreciate it thank you <laughs> how about um anyone else from our audience have anything that they want to ask to our expert today up oh, there's just something just populated uh here's a comment the data shows that people getting infected uh, i'm sorry the data shows that people are getting infected but mortality rate is down because of the demographics age that it infects when a 19-year-old dies, that becomes a natural use news story, but not when somebody who is 90. So, I mean, that was just a comment, not a question. Um, is um, there anything that you've explored that, that could uh, speak to that? No, but what I do remember is that the number of deaths in Pennsylvania were very high because of the uh, long care facilities. So a lot mm -hmm. of elderly people died in, in Pennsylvania, uh, actually in the... Uh, Pennsylvania Department of Health website, they started uh, as part of their data packet, they would talk about the infections in care homes. Ah. And in Florida, Miami-Dade County, uh, there's a lot of elderly people down there. And, and they're also getting, uh, they're getting hammered. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did have another question. One second. I just lost it. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I have one that says, the virus has been reported to be, I'm sorry, about 1% lethal. Are we exaggerating in that response? 
No. Mm -hmm. I mean, about 1% lethal. Uh, what's the population of the United States? 330 million people, thereabouts. What is 1% of 330 million? I don't know. No, I'm just saying, right? I mean, we're talking about a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, how many people have died in on the planet so far? You know, over yeah. half a mi half a million, right? In the U.S. alone, more people have died of this virus than during the Vietnam War. And also, it's mm -hmm. not only that if you get sick, you have a full recovery. Uh, I remember looking at a sheet of sheet of statistics. I don't have it with me but all this information is out there, but there are a lot of people that are going to be suffering for a really long time from, from long-term damage from this virus. So again, I mean, nobody that plays with this virus is going to tell you we know everything about it. We still mm -hmm. don't know a lot, uh, but what we know is that, I mean, when's the last time you were in a quarantine like this? Never. I, I don't remember. You know, I got married when the, uh, the swine flu uh, was circulating and, and the situation wasn't <laughs> like this. So this is, it's a very dangerous virus. I mean, it, it's everywhere uh, and it's going to stop when it stops. So we yeah. just have to try to starve it. That's, that's the best we can do. Once, once there's a vaccine that, you know, that attacks several strains of the virus because it will keep mutating, uh, then the situation will be a little different. Yeah, and it, it is um, uh, such a highly unusual experience for all of us at different ages. Um, and it, it's just been un unbelievable. A um, couple of things. Um, your opinion on moving data from the CDC. Not, that's all it says, so. Right, right, I think, um, uh, just if, if I understand the question correctly, just recently uh, there came a, a government mandate that all the data had to be now handled first by another office, uh, Health and Human Services, maybe HHS. Um, and there are a lot of people talking about transparency and, and whatnot, but I think this is still developing. What I hear from the CDC is that they still have access to the data, but it is unusual for the CDC to not get this information directly, but I, that's all I know. Dr. Garza, um, how, can you tell us how accurate are the mathematical models that are used to predict the behavior of the coronavirus? Woof. <laughs> all right, well, what I presented was crap. I just, I just wanted to show to you, you know, how this works. Uh, Again, there are a lot of people right now trying to figure this out with, with degrees of accuracy. If, if you start digging into the CDC website under their, their data uh, site, they actually have different models and how the data is being propagated. So this is no different than trying to predict the, the path of a hurricane. You know, I mean, living in Florida, you, you know, sometimes in the news you, you would see the path of the hurricane and then the long-term forecast. And they would talk about using 11 different models and you know, all these models were like diverging. So, I mean, we have a sense of what's happening, but again, uh, nothing to say, yes, we really understand this disease, not, not yet. I mean, we have a good idea, uh, but in terms of, of precision, I mean, this is, this is all from simulations, right? And let's remember that a simulation is somebody programming parameters in a computer and, you know, gathering a, lo a lot of data, uh, a lot of statistics and so on. But, I mean, you, you can only give, you know, uh, intervals of, you know, of information. You can say, you know, and we've heard, right, that by August, like about 180,000 people will have died. Mm. Well, I mean, is that, you know, 179,450 or 182,000? It's like, well, they're about, right? So, so the range is in the thousands of people. Right. But, I mean, the trend is there. Thank you. Another question just popped up. Let's see. 
Your charts are very compelling, Dr. Garza. Do you believe there is a way that these kinds of charts can be part of the messaging meant to convince the public that this must be taken seriously? I mean, they're widely available. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I took them from Johns Hopkins. I took them from the CDC. The information is out there. You, you just have to want to look at it. And I, I think it's not for lack of exposure. It, it's there. Well, I'm super grateful for you making the stuff that's widely available um, able to be reached by someone in my kind of brain. Like, I don't math at all. And um, it was very easy for me to follow and understand what you said. And sometimes, you know, I'm sure that there are others like me watching the news and reading some of the stuff. It's difficult. So you, you made that um, easier for me to digest. And I appreciate that. So thank you for, for doing that today. Well, you're welcome. Another question is, uh, some scientists have changed their minds about certain things like using masks. Um, do you still trust them? Oh, absolutely. Yes, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, sci science is, is a, a never-ending endeavor. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you think of what we know for certain in, in scientific terms, we call it laws, like, the, like Newton's mm -hmm. laws of motion. So that was the law of the land for hundreds of years. And then this pal named Einstein came over <laughs> and said, well, yeah, Newton's stuff works, but at the specific state, scale and so on. So you can, you can only work with what you have at a given time. So, you know, what happened back in February is different than what's happening in July. So I, you know, I mean, as, as a scientist, I, I trust my fellow scientists to be honest in what they're saying. And, and we need to understand that it's not all set in stone because if the data changes, if the behaviors change, then things are going to be different. And so we may have to take, you know, different measures. So we just have to be current and, you know, and then coding, you know, say somebody said this back in, you know, March. Uh, okay. That was four months ago. You know, the infection started in April. I mean, sorry, in March. Uh, I mean, I mean, we started recording it, right? That's only four months. So whatever happened two months ago, that's half the life of the pandemic. So of course things are going to evolve. Right. I, I that sentiment also. Audience, any other questions for us out there? All right, so I think we're going to start to wrap things up unless somebody else pops something up in the Q&A. But we'd like to thank you, Dr. Martinez Garza, for chatting with us today and about flattening the curve and really minimizing exposure um, moving forward. We'd also like to thank our audience for joining us for today's Lionside Chat. Um, as you click out of the webinar, you're going to receive access to a survey. Just please take a few minutes to let us know how things are doing, um, or how we're doing on our chats. And you can even share some future ideas for our lion side chats, okay? We actually, uh, questions, oh, comments something coming up, in. Okay, we just got yep. some thank you. Um, <laughs> and actually, sorry, we have, why didn't we see some huge spikes after the riots in Minnesota was a question that just came in, Dr. Garza. The demonstrations and some riots, right? I mean, we're talking about the news. You know, hundreds of thousands of people demonstrating and a few hundred, you know, creating damage. It's not the same thing. Um, I, I saw people wearing masks. Now, some of them were, were screaming and so on. Uh, but I guess they were exercising some sort of social distancing, right? I can only go by what the media showed me. I wasn't there, so I, I cannot speak to that. So if, if there haven't been huge spikes, uh, it's been more than 14 days. That's what we understand to be the incubation period for this virus. So they must have done something right. But uh, you know what? I'll be honest with you, I didn't, I didn't even look at the Johns Hopkins, Hopkins data on that. So I'll, I'll go look at it right now because that's, that's a very good question. It's a very valid point and it's intriguing. Excellent. Okay. Well, we would like to thank you again for joining us today. And we would like to encourage our um, audience to please 
complete the survey that's available. And also we'd like to invite you to join us for our next Lionside chat, which is coming up this Wednesday, July 22nd. And that's gonna be hosted by uh, Ms. Sharon Peterson Ogaldez. And then we're gonna be talking about how culture affects response to the COVID-19 virus. That's gonna be Wednesday, July 22nd from 10 until 11. And we'd like to welcome you all back to, to join us again. And please take a few minutes to fill out the survey once we conclude our, um, our show today. All right. Our Thank show. you so much. It is our show. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> and thank you again. Enjoy your afternoon. Signing off until next time. Stay safe.